Welcome. We're really lucky to have tonight an opportunity to talk about South Korea. Um, it'll be one of those, th we're getting a break from a conversation about North Korea this time, and we're lucky enough to have Dr. Giwok Shin and also Ambassador Stevens, who has, uh, Kathleen Stevens first was introduced to South Korea, I think, as a Peace Corps volunteer yes. there, and you speak Korean. Yes, right? badly. <laughs> <laughs> badly, well, a lot better than I do. And, um, and then came back, of course, as, as our ambassador there. And while being ambassador, not only did she uh, undertake all the activities of a diplomat, but she also bicycled around the country and got to know it that way as well. Um, Professor Shin is, um, is at, the, at Stanford as well. In fact, they're both at Stanford at the, uh, at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. Um, and he, his expertise really is in political, so or political sociology, is that the mm -hmm. right, right term? And so he has a, a, a deep understanding of social movements, uh, nationalism development, as well as uh, international relations. So we're, we're lucky to have them both. I should also note that he's the author of a couple books, but one of them he wrote with Dan Snyder called Superficial Korea, Divergent Memories, which I think is an interesting topic. It takes a look at, um, at the divergent views of what, what the Asia Pacific War was about, but also a book called Global Talent, Skilled Labor, and Social Capital in Korea. And I just found out uh, ethnic nationalism in Korea as well. So I might even start with, mm -hmm. actually, why don't I just start with a bit of history mm -hmm. and you tell us a little bit about why we have a divided peninsula to begin with. What was that? What, what happened immediately after the, the, the First World War, the Second World War? Uh, so you want to go back to? We can, we can start with the Korean War if you want to <laughs> get more recent. <laughs> okay. So it's very nice to see you. Uh, I was here about 10 years ago. Uh, when uh, conservative uh, came back to power uh, after 10-year rule by progressive. Now, as you know now, progressive back to power. So only when there is a power shift in Korean politics, I get invitation uh, from World Office Council. But uh, uh, let me just look at you know, what happened last couple of years. Okay. Maybe that's uh, probably good okay. way of starting uh, right. conversation. Uh, so as you may see, uh, in a South Korean president, uh, Park Geun-hye, uh, was impeached uh, last year. Uh, That's the first time uh, in South Korean history. Okay. And then even though impeachment process uh, went through in a highly uh, elaborate uh, institutional process, the main impetus came from below you know, by people. Uh, so for about 10 weeks, uh, tens of uh, millions of Korean uh, were mobilized uh, on the street. I attended uh, one of those, uh, you know, protests, and it's quite amazing that, like, you know, a million people uh, gathered uh, in downtown Seoul and then uh, calling for uh, political reform. So South Korea went through a uh, really uh, tough uh, political turmoil uh, since late uh, 2016. Uh, and then uh, last May, they elected a uh, new president, uh, who was Moon Jae-in, uh, who came into power. Uh, as you may know, uh, he was a friend and key advisor to the late president, Do Moo Hyun, who was the last uh, progressive uh, South Korean uh, president. And now the, the, the main coal power elite uh, in the new government, I, I, I think this may have some implications that we might have discussion, but uh, again, many of them were former activists uh, who participate in the pro-democracy movement in 1980s. And actually some of them were quite anti-American. Uh, hopefully they may have changed by now. But certainly, they led uh, anti-American uh, pro-democracy movement in the 1980s. Were they anti-American because they perceived this as a barrier to peace, or what was? Uh, so a barrier to Korean democracy. Uh, to Korean democracy. Right. So if you look at Korean history, so now I'm going back to uh, you know history because uh, for a long time, uh, you know, United States uh, supported uh, South Korea. And in many ways, the uh, U.S. was instrumental to South Korean development, but they also included supporting Korean dictators. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so by 1980s, uh, many South Korean activists, they believe that Okay, without liberating South Korea, I'm just quoting their logic. It's not my view, okay? <laughs> uh, unless we liberate uh, Korea from American imperialism, that's what they said, uh, there's no hope to achieve Korean democracy. I mean, that's why uh, their uh, pro-democracy movement took some anti-American uh, you know, contours mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Now, you know, many of them were in jail for their activism, but now they really uh, comprise core elite uh, of the new government. So when we think of uh, President Moon, we, we think of someone who came to office in part on a, on a bit of a, a peace platform, mm -hmm. on the notion that we should have conversations with the North and right. find a way, find a solution to this problem. What did, what did Moon inherit? So if you look at uh, Korean history, uh, during uh, progressive rules, uh, let's say from late uh, 1990s through like uh, 2007, uh, under Kim Dae-jung and No Mu-hyun in a government, uh, there's a lot of inter-Korean uh, you know, you know, dialogue and you know, engagement. But after that, uh, during the last the two, conservative administration, there's a lot of tension mm -hmm. uh, between uh, two Koreas. So <coughs> Moon Jae-in came into power on the mandate of improving uh, inter-Korea relations. But then as you know that uh, there's a lot of tensions uh, on the Korean Peninsula, also tension between uh, North Korea and the United States. So actually he came into power in a very difficult in a situation in terms of uh, uh, North Korean issue. Mm -hmm. and Ambassador Stevens, uh, in the meantime, um, uh, South Korea became one of the Asian tigers, an extraordinary story of economic development. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about um, what, what were the smart choices they made and mm -hmm. what were the advantages they had that brought them to mm -hmm. uh, such a stunning, uh, a stunning record economically? Uh, well, thank you very much. I also want to say I'm delighted to be here tonight and to have a chance to talk about South Korea, the Republic of Korea, although to get to kind of your first question, clearly we have to talk about the Korean Peninsula mm -hmm. because this was a, a unified state for a long period of time and it was divided through no fault of its own. Uh, it was supposed to be a temporary division. This is my short history for, uh, and, uh, uh, and then a, 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 an armistice uh, after the Korean War ended in 1953 that hardened into a, uh, an imperfect, uh, but nonetheless useful peace that allowed South Korea to uh, begin its extraordinary rise as a modern state. Um, I'm preparing a class for Stanford for the next quarter, and I was looking at readings, and because uh, we we're talking so much about North Korea now, and uh, I realize there's a book that I've, I've looked at for some time. It's called Korea, the Impossible State, and that's by a scholar named Victor Cha, who, uh, and that's about North Korea. Mm -hmm. And then I found another book that's by a former uh, uh, journalist for The uh, Economist who was in Seoul, and the title is Korea, the Impossible Country. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of impossible for me to tell you in a very <laughs> short period of time um, how, in a way, dynamic and di dynamically different uh, these two places are in their journeys uh, since that division mm. uh, in 1945 and then made permanent in 1953. Uh, now we're uh, in a year where they're, you know, they're marking uh, this uh, 70th anniversary of the establishment of these rival states. But in South Korea, we, we see in the most unpromising of circumstances an extraordinary journey. Um, there's a cliche that calls it sometimes the miracle on the Han, the miracle on the Han River, that, that <coughs> this country that when the war ended after a period of Japanese colonialism and defeat, uh, uh, leveled up by war, divided, uh, uh, at poorer than most countries in, in Asia or even in the rest of the developing world, uh, began this extraordinary rise. I don't think it was a miracle because I know it took enormous sacrifice and then now to get to your question, a number of things. And I think mostly it was the talent, the determination, honestly, of people to build a modern Korean state. Uh, and they did have uh, the protection of the United States and also our open markets. So I think we as Americans can take some satisfaction in this extraordinary economic rise. And this was coupled, I saw this as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 70s when I was first in Korea, uh, when you could see day by day, 
people's lives getting better. But it wasn't an authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. no political discussion. And when I went back as a young diplomat in the 1980s, I saw what Professor Shin was talking about. Suddenly people saying, we want to have a voice in our politics too. And that second, not miracle, but that second extraordinary achievement was the democratization of Korea. But as we see in our own country, I mean, democracy is a journey, not a destination. And Korean democracy has been on a, a bumpy journey for a while. But when I went back as ambassador, and now as we see now, as, as we see 30 years after uh, the Olympics were hosted in Seoul in 1988, and I saw that, the establishment of Korea, we, South Korea, we have arrived. We represent what it means to be Korean in the 20th and now the 21st century. Uh, there's a spoiler called North Korea. Now, 30 years later, we're kind of facing some of those same things. Uh, uh, the Republic of Korea is a, is a middle power in the world. It sits at the top table of developed economies. And it does it because it, it, it has a, a market economy. It's had good leadership, not without corruption, not without political turmoil. Uh, but it's had people who have had a, a determination, and it's a very simple way, I think, to, to build a nation, to build a, a, a uh, a society that works for their people. And it's been extraordinary, inspiring, I think, yeah. to, mm. to me and to the world. Now, has it been consistent in investing in education, investing in technology, and other yes. investing both in people but also in innovation? Absolutely. You know, I think when you're a, 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 a country like Korea, and this is not just in the 20th century, this is for, you know, millennia, this is a small place that has retained its identity and more or less its independence, right, mm -hmm. uh, in between China and Japan. Uh, and to do that, you have to be faster and quicker than everybody else. So I think this emphasis, not that everything, on education uh, and on trying to stay ahead, take a few more risks, uh, is, is very much, if I may say, kind of, this may not be too scholarly, but kind of embedded in, in Korean culture and in Korean history. Mm -hmm. um, there are some downsides, too, mm -hmm. obviously, and I think in modern Korean society, I don't want to paint this as a paradise. You guys, uh, it, it would, would, those of you who know South Korea would know that uh, there are tremendous pressures on young people in Korea. We see them in our own society about issues that we see here, too dissatisfaction with corruption in the society. That's what we saw really really emerge last year. Um, inequality, a sense that the, uh, the, the path of opportunity for upper mobility has narrowed. So they're dealing with all that, but those are a those product of relatively recent success. But it is those basic you know, attachment to excellence, to retaining their independence and, and, and being competitive in a very, very competitive neighborhood. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that the top 10% of earners uh, capture 45% of, right. of, the, of the wealth. It, it is worse in other places. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it, it, but it's it, worse in Korea than it used to be. Than so. it used to yep. be, and, that, and right. that that society finds tolerable. So um, part of this is opening and connecting the economy. It's trade. Um, to what extent, who are its trading partners? To what extent is the, is the economy really dependent on trade? Um, I'm going to start with you, Ambassador, and then I'm going to turn to you. Well, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, its official name, <laughs> um, is, uh, I think, one of the most trade-dependent economies in the world. You'd have to look at little city-states like Singapore to see ones that are more trade-dependent. Mm -hmm. You know, more of its GDP come from that. So absolutely very trade-dependent. Uh, China is now its largest tra mm -hmm. trading partner. Uh, that poses you know, <laughs> challenges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. remains an important partner. And uh, South Korea has been very proactive over the years in uh, reaching bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements with other countries. Including with us. Including with us and with mm -hmm. the EU. Now we have a Trump administration uh, that has uh, an, an American president who has followed through in part on his campaign pledge to relook at not yet withdraw from uh, the, uh, the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. So that is making Korea think again about the role of the U.S., mm -hmm. about its commitment to the rules-based order and free trade order that we have been associated with in the past. And, you know, this recent decision on, on uh, washing machines and solar panels, <laughs> uh, the solar panels have gotten more attention, but the washing machines, a lot of them have names mm -hmm. like LG and Samsung, <coughs> which, of course, are South Korean companies. And this is a decision to levy tariffs. A on decision to levy yeah. tariffs. Which pretty high uh, tariffs, too. Uh, yeah. Pretty high yeah. tariffs, yeah. yeah. And I think the South Koreans, again, they are so sensitive and, if you like, dependent 
dependent on the security relationship with the United States with managing the rela this relationship. They will try to manage this, this desire now in Washington to look again at the free trade agreement, to rebalance uh, the trade agreement. And they'll try to do that in a very sensitive way. But I think that they will be very disconcerted mm -hmm. if they find that the Trump administration is really going to go in a, in a very different and more protectionist direction. Mm -hmm. That, you know, as well as secure this sense of security assurances uh, will be very important to the future of the relationship. Yeah. Do you want to comment on trade or I'll take well, you to Sure. So I think that's why South Korea, you know, facing certain dilemma because uh, in terms of trade and economy, China has become, you know, very, very important. Uh, if you look at the volume of trade for South Korea, you know, what they have with China is much larger than what they have with U.S. and Japan combined. Mm -hmm. So economically, China has become so important. At the same time, uh, for national security, uh, U.S. remains the main ally. So sometimes there can be tension uh, between you know, you know, economic issue and security issue. Okay, now uh, you know, we have to be a little careful because uh, if we push uh, South Korea too much, too far, then without intention or not, uh, we may push South Korea toward China, which I don't think that's what we want. So, uh, you know, this is not only uh, applies to South Korea, but many countries in Asia, because uh, you know, they are a little uneasy with the rise of China. At the same time, uh, we, you know, with the coming of power Trump administration, and a lot of you know, Asians are quite nervous, actually. And South Korea is not an exception. So I assume they are OK. South, South Korea was part of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Was it one of the 11 countries? I actually don't uh, know it, the answer it to was, that. It was yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, it was not? Because, yeah. because it already had the US-Korea Free Trade Agreement. Right. Ah. But yeah. it was looking to join. Right. And well, now it appears to be going forward without the United States. Are they? Is, is there any consideration of the ROK joining? Uh, there will be, depending on, I think, where the TPP goes, yeah. where that goes. But, but the ROK is also still very focused in trying to, to maintain uh, and preserve the uh, Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they also have a free trade with China. Yeah. So. But not as, not as good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 So, so yeah. I, I, Ambassador Steve has mentioned identity and being caught, the issue is looking at the identity of Japan and China, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask you much more about the ethnic identifier yeah. and it, in the sense of being uh, the pride in being Korean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in particular, I think I, I, in one of your books or one of your articles, you said that um, that South Koreans are able to hold two images simultaneously, mm -hmm. and one is in their role in a globalized world, in a global economy, and the other is in their in their role as as ethnic Koreans. They're ethnic national mm -hmm. identity. Talk about how that plays out for them and how important is that sense of affinity with Koreans to the north of the 38th pa mm -hmm. parallel? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as uh, Ambassador you know, Sims mentioned, uh, Korea has a long history of having unified uh, nation or nation state, right? And then in 1945, uh, it was divided into two you know, different states and still remain uh, today. So Korea has been very proud of being you know, ethnically homogeneous and having a you know, single nation for a long time. And you know, in a sense, uh, unification uh, has been you know, politically correct issue. You know, in the past, uh, even though you may not support that, but still you're not going to say against uh, you know, publicly. But I think right now uh, I see some you know, very important change, especially among uh, young people. Uh, as you know, in, in two weeks, uh, South Korea will be hosting uh, Winter Olympic, right? And then in recent weeks, uh, North and South Korea uh, talked about uh, North Korean participation and having a single you know, team in uh, almost ice hockey and so on. And one thing interesting is that uh, when the Korean government uh, announced that uh, North and South Korea will have you know, single unified uh, almost ice hockey team, and more than 70% of people opposed. 
Mm. I, I was very really surprised <laughs> because uh, you know, in the past, like 20 years ago, uh, people will embrace. Yeah, that's great. You know, we are the same people, same nation. Let's do it. But this time, especially, especially young people, they are very unhappy with this decision because they're saying that it's very unfair to the players, I mean, you know, South Korean players who spent a lot of their time and energy in preparing for the Olympics, okay? It's because they have to lose their playing time. So it's not fair to them. And also they are saying that, you know, the government cannot make uh, on its own uh, that decision without consulting the stakeholders. So I was surprised. I think the government was quite surprised too. So although there's certain sentiments that now uh, South is giving too much concession uh, to the North. Okay, and then of course uh, critics saying now, you know, Pyeongchang Olympic is becoming uh, Pyongyang Olympic, right? <laughs> and then some people say, well, that's only critic by conservative, but I think that you know, strikes some popular, you know, calls, calls actually. So uh, I think things may have changed quite a bit uh, compared to, let's say, uh, 20 years ago. Now people just don't jump into such idea of having uh, unified North and South Korean team. So, but King Chung Un has been particularly vocal of, of late on the need for unification, or his desire for unification, and calling upon Korean people everywhere to uh, cooperate, have contact, and ultimately move to move to unification. Is there is, is that sort of motherhood and apple pie, or is there a sense of being, you know, gee, that's propaganda, that's you know. How, how is that received, or is it just seen as he says these kinds of things with frequency? I don't think uh, in South Korea people talk much more about unification. Mm -hmm. I, I think until now, you know, most people are worried about uh, North Korea and nuclear threat mm -hmm. and possible war on the Korean Peninsula, especially uh, when tensions between U.S. and North Korea escalate. So. They are more worried about you know, possible war and nuclear threat uh, than unification. I mean, that's one reason why uh, you know, former President uh, you know, Park Geun-hye you know, said that you know, unification can be a bonanza right? or a jackpot. Right? Mm -hmm. They try to revive interesting unification. But uh, you know, I was in South Korea recently, but people don't really talk about unification mm. much. Mm. And then it's more like uh, you know, worry about war. Yes, yeah, so it turns out our audience does, because I've got three cards I'm going to read to you, and then I'm going to turn to you, Ambassador. But th this card asks, in terms of reunification, do you think it is economically feasible for North Korea and South Korea to unify? What would the U.S. role be in that unification? Next question card, do the Korean people want to unify? And third, what would a unified Korea look like? How would it be governed? That's okay. all to you. <laughs> and then so I'm so going to so turn. So should I address or you want to address? Well, okay, yeah, okay. It, give us a, your quick response. You know, once again, uh, unification might be politically correct issue. Okay, a lot of people may not say against publicly once again. But if you talk to people, especially young people, I don't think they necessarily want unification because they are worried that uh, it might hurt their own life because uh, it will be economically very yeah. expensive and social con cultural integration uh, will cost a lot also. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a lot of young people, uh, frankly speaking, they just want peace. They don't really want uh, unification. Ambassador Stevens. I, I mean, I, I th s certainly agree that, that that is the case now. And, uh, and the, the polling that, uh, that Professor Shin mentioned was uh, quite striking in terms of some of the skepticism about this, uh, uh, the Olympics. That said, I, I, I think public attitudes on this have to be taken with a little bit of grain of salt because it really depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> depends on, the, on what's happening on the peninsula. Um, I mean, if I can just back up a little bit and say very, uh, I mean, yes, Koreans uh, have, have, have become much more global. It's one of the, the big changes you see. And a South Korean, a young South Korean is global. Koreans have passports. They feel very comfortable. They're, they they want to be global citizens. But North Korea is there. It's, it's, if, it, you know, it's at the very least a spoiler, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a national mission. And uh, I, I think it's a matter of Koreans at some point may think they don't have any choice 
but to address the challenges that North Korea poses. And they would like to have, obviously, a soft landing. That's the, that's the ideal scenario, that somehow North Korea kind of comes to its senses, if you like, and gradually, gradually uh, becomes uh, more accommodating to the South, and you have a very gradual reconciliation, maybe eventually reunification. Well, the world doesn't always work like that. Mm -hmm. And what we do see, and I've seen it in places like the Balkans and other places in post-Cold War Europe, um, the sense of national identity kind of ebbs and flows depending on both political le leadership and the, and, the, and the situation. But if I could just add, the other thing about North Korea is I think what you see in the North Korean propaganda, if you like, the appeal that Kim Jong-un is making is a calculation that, he, uh, that I think may be a little bit now anachronistic, that South Koreans will respond to this notion that the North Koreans are the true Koreans. They have not been corrupted mm -hmm. by foreign influence. Mm -hmm. They have stood up to the Americans. They have achieved nuclear success. And now in the 70th year of the founding of the two rival states, you know, the Koreans can stand proud. And I don't think that will have an appeal to a more sophisticated mm -hmm. global South Korean public that North Korea may, may think it might. And yeah. this will affect the, cal the, the, the policy of the Moon Jae-in government. Yeah. Now, of course, a nightmare scenario of unification um, is a failed state mm -hmm. in the North mm -hmm. uh, and impoverished, hungry people uh, becoming refugees, in <coughs> essence. As we and, and other governments kind of tighten the screws on the sanctions, is there a kind of calibration that has to happen? Or uh, how, how, how do we think about that because um, it's pretty hard to know what is the tipping point for this kind of thing. But what are the considerations within a government like ours uh, as we think about uh, the use of sanctions in order to achieve a political result? Well, first, I think we have to face the fact that sanctions are a blunt instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, they're important, but it's very difficult to calibrate mm -hmm. you know, what kind of impact they'll have and when they will have it. So you have just have to use it with that that in mind and try to uh, try as you say to calibrate to the extent uh, you can uh, the succeeding administrations in in washington including the trump administration has said repeatedly well said a number of things that are sometimes contradictory but <laughs> secretary tillerson has said repeatedly that uh, uh, the aim of sanctions is not 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 to 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 bring the the, re the north korean regime to its knees but to the table right so not regime collapse but a negotiating table but right, what does that mean? And is it possible for the North Korean regime to come to negotiate what it considers to be its uh, a hedge against the existential threat it sees posed not only by the United States, but by the existence of South Korea? Mm -hmm. So, so, so let's collapse let's is, a, is, a, is, a, is a possibility. Yeah, <laughs> let's, I mean, let's take a moment to go into the minds of, of leaders in the North <coughs> from, from from the perspective of Kim and, and, and those around him, what does the nuclear capability bring them? Is there, is there a, a, an actual security threat that they see for which conventional weapons can't protect them? Mm -hmm. So I think there are multiple uh, you know, regions. So one is uh, North Korea cannot compete you know, with South Korea in terms of uh, conventional weapons. You know, very expensive, and as you know, uh, you know, North Korean economy is much smaller than South Korea. So in terms of conventional weapon, uh, North Korea cannot, you know, compete uh, with the South but Korea. But does the threat come from the South in their minds? Uh, I'm sure. Also, uh, think about, okay, so if, if you are a North Korean leader, okay, South Korea is much bigger, much wealthier with the U.S. forces on the ground. I mean, we already talk about North Korean threats. But if you're a North Korean leader, I mean, wouldn't you feel threatened by the presence of U.S. military forces with a much wealthier South Korean state? Okay, so uh, actually, uh, nuclear weapon can be cheaper than uh, conventional weapon spending. Uh, so I think you know, their logic is that once they achieve uh, North Korea, I mean, a nuclear state status, I'm sure that they wanted to spend more resource for economic development. So if you, if you look at uh, North Korean uh, logic, their rhetoric, uh, they really wanted to pursue what they call Pyongjin, uh, parallel or simultaneous uh, development of a nuclear 
the web port and, and so. economy. No, econ oh, and econ the economy. economy, right. So once they secure uh, nuclear power, then they want to develop the economy. Okay. So I mean, this is a very familiar logic in East Asian history. This is what uh, made Japan pursued, a strong military rich nation. That's what Park jong hee did in South Korea. I think that's what North Korea is trying to do. So I mean, that's why once they, I don't think uh, developing nuclear weapon itself is their goal. Eventually, they wanted to develop economy as well. So Ambassador Stevens, to, to what extent are they seeking respect, dignity, a role on the world stage? And to what extent are they concerned that we may be about <coughs> regime change? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's more about regime survival. Obviously, they would like to have respect, but I, I, I do think that, uh, right, North Korea and, and its leadership recognizes correctly that it has been outpaced by South Korea. And that's happened, and which was not the case in the 60s, right? When, when South, and South Korea is a threat. These are mirror images. These are competing you know, notions of what it means to be Korean. Um, so they've been outpaced. And, and by the way, also with the end of the Cold War, they lost their patrons in the Soviet Union and China. So, uh, so South Korea, backed up by its alliance with the United States, poses, I think, to North Korea an existential threat. And they see the nuclear weapons, which they began to pursue in, as in, in, in earnest uh, after the uh, end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, is their best security guarantee. I think under the current leadership, uh, Kim Jong-un, it also has taken on uh, uh, added significance as a an important pillar of regime legitimacy in the North. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen some photographs in North Korea where mm -hmm. like, you know, all the amusement parks are like little rockets going around on a, you know, mm -hmm. a little amusement uh, a ride uh, or uh, the pop bands uh, performing with uh, nuclear bombs exploding in the air. That, that, that is actually really, uh, I mean, national pride. We did it. We may be poor. The North Koreans know that they are mm -hmm. poorer than South Koreans now. They haven't been able to keep all that information out. They know they're isolated. Uh, but they've done this. They've, they've achieved the advanced state of, of, of being, and they would like to be recognized or at least accepted or acquiesced in as a, as a nuclear power state. Um, so I do think that with going to the Olympics, uh, they hope that they will get, yeah, some respect too. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And North Korea has, while certainly uh, it, has, it has not achieved uh, uh, economic development uh, uh, to compare with the other successful c economies of, of Asia, under Kim Jong-un, really out of necessity, um, it has allowed the market uh, to function, basically because the public distribution systems collapsed. Uh, and given the, the entrepreneurship and the energy of the and the desperation, I think, of the people of North Korea, it's resulted in economic growth. So North Korea has had, if you like, you know, if the Chinese had reform and opening, they're trying to have reform without opening. Now, that probably only gets you so far, mm -hmm. especially if you're under sanctions. But that's what they're trying to do. And it was, a, it was an speaking of the sanctions, it was an extraordinary accomplishment <coughs> of Ambassador Nikki Haley and, and the Trump administration to get the entire Security Council on board um, and, uh, and, and squeezing w with even tougher sanctions affecting uh, the transfer yes. of, of energy sources. Kim Jong-un seems to have made a very smart move to reach out with the Olympics as the opening gambit to reach out to have talks. Um, those talks were welcomed by the South. They were welcomed by the Trump administration. He got more than an agreement to the Olympics. He got an agreement that they would resume mill-to-mill -mill talks, and, um, and he bought time. Right. How much time does he need to miniaturize his foreheads and achieve his ultimate ambition with, with the, the capacity to to attack any part of the United States with the ICBMs. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of that? Uh, I think the estimates uh, you know, vary, but maybe, I don't know, six months, maybe no more than a year. So uh, certainly he's buying time. And then with uh, more pressure from China, you know, certainly uh, South Korea can be a good alternative. And then he knows that South Korea cannot say no, right? <laughs> so, you know, obviously, uh, right now, it's a no-brainer for North Korea in reaching out to South Korea. And obviously, 
uh, North Korea is getting what they want. And for Moon government, in a sense, they are taking certain risk. Because uh, what if uh, North Korea tests the missile after Olympic ends? After the Olympics. Right. And then, uh, you know, Moon Jae-in will be facing very difficult uh, political situation, you know, you know, both inside Korea and also, you know, outside of Korea. So, uh, right now, you know, you know, South Korean government uh, has little choice but to embrace North Korea in participation in the Olympic. But at the same time, there's, I think, there's a great risk that they have to manage uh, very carefully and cautiously. Do you think, uh, Ambassador Stevens, that in fact that that Moon also? Uh, played this wisely. I mean, it was smart to sort of keep it on, keep it on topic, um, do the, sort of the right, the right gesture, and have a conversation that actually didn't involve the United States, that was just between the two of them on an issue that was non-explosive, to excuse the, excuse the term. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually think he has handled it, I mean, one, as, as he kind of had to. I agree with Professor Shin, he really didn't have a choice, but I think he's handled it quite well. Now, there's, as again, been some unease in South Korea about the extent to which the, the team is a joint team. They haven't done that before and, and some of the details. And I think we'll have to see how things play out in the Olympics as to what the mood is going forward. But, uh, but no, I, I, I think, again, you know, South Korea is one of South Korea's strategic dilemmas. I mean, here's this country that's accomplished so much, respected in the world, you know, middle power, all of this. And as I said earlier, North Korea is always a spoiler. That's never more true than when they host some big international event. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I was in Korea in the 1980s when they were preparing for the 1988 Olympics. The North Koreans blew up a civilian yeah. plane coming back with, with Korean workers from the Middle East and killed everybody. Yeah. Oh. This was less than a year before yeah. the 88 Olympic Games. They did it. They, they, they conducted a, a, a very serious attack provocation um, against South Korean forces uh, in the middle of the World Cup in 2002. There was a lot of worry last December. I was also in Korea briefly in December, and a lot of worry in South Korea about, you know, here you have all these tests from North Korea. You've got China mad at South Korea about uh, uh, missile, uh, anti-missile defense deployments. Uh, you've got the Russians, you know, getting their team banned. They were really worried about the Olympics. It's a big deal for them. They, they bid on this Olympics, like, I think, three or four times before they got it. Um, so, so, you know, to have the, the you know, Kim Jong-un basically, you know, uh, uh, respond positively to the olive branch that the South Koreans had been rather, you know, sadly proffering for a long time was a relief. Uh, and I think the mill mill uh, uh, reengagement, and when we say the mill mill engagement, I, you know, we're really talking about some pretty old fashioned, you know, landline phone lines at various places along that DMZ. By the way, a misnomer, right? It's the most militarized zone <laughs> in the world. Th that's good for everybody, because you don't want, you know, we we may come to blows, but you don't want to stumble into it if you can avoid it. And just being able to pick up the phone is something that probably the North Koreans want to do too. They've had a couple of people run across the border, but you want to be able to not start a war, right? Uh, when you didn't mean to, anyway. Well, and you sure as heck actually don't want defections during the Olympics. Yeah, you so, don't want yeah. so you have- Embarrassment on the right, other side. Right, so yeah. exactly. So, th so you have this period through the Olympics. Uh, it's the regular Olympics, the Paralympics. By the end of the March, uh, I mean, I agree. Uh, you know, I would, uh, we're gonna have questions about uh, will there be, planned U.S. Uh, South Korean military uh, exercises, yeah. which will go forward. Right. The exercises have been, and I think remain, an important part of the, the effort to contain and deter the serious threat that does come from North Korea. Uh, you'll have pressure uh, uh, from North Korea to, uh, on South Korea to, to loosen up a little bit on, on, not on sanctions, but humanitarian aid. There's always a humanitarian cutout for sanctions, but mm -hmm. right where that line is, is, yeah. is a very mm -hmm. tricky thing. Mm -hmm. And that could create some tensions between Washington and Seoul, which Pyongyang may well yeah. you know, want. Well they, well, they do. But we kind of know that. So, uh, so I think, yeah, the spring will be a very difficult yeah. period, but I think it's worth it to take this risk, if you like, to try to open up something I'm not being Pollyannish here, but try to open up something. And the South Koreans have been persistent in saying to the North Koreans, we've got to talk about the nuclear program too, and you've got to talk to the Americans about it.
The North Koreans have no, shown no sign they're going to do it, but you know you got to keep at it. Yeah, he he also uh, President Moon also did something interesting, and that is that he he gave credit to Donald Trump, <laughs> making it possible for Donald Trump to in fact welcome those talks. Good and emotional this, intelligence. Yeah, good emotional <laughs> intelligence. Um, so let's just say we do get to the negotiating table. Right now, what the president is saying is that a precondition is that you agree to eliminate your nuclear weapons. You're an ambassador. You've been around and in negotiations in your life. It, if we were to say it's our goal of the negotiations as opposed to the preconditions, do we have something to talk about? Yes, I think we would have a lot to talk about. Um, I, I, I think that we, we, you know, we do want to see you know, some, some commitment to, to eventually reaching uh, a denuclearized Korean peninsula. But at this point, to get into talks, that's going to be have, have to be maybe even our saying we want that and the North Koreans saying, well, we're a nuclear state and we just sort of agree that that's how we feel, but you start talking. But what could we talk about? Safety, nuclear safety, uh, uh, communications to avoid accidents. I mean, you can find things to talk about uh, that would at least start the conversation, again, lower the, the, the chances of, of an accident uh, or a blundering into war that I, I, I don't think North Korea wants and, and that we don't want either. Uh, I think that's, that's where we are. Uh, you can talk about, about deterrence. Uh, I do think that uh, we have managed, you know, absent the nuclear threat, to deter and contain North Korea for, uh, for 60, 65 years. Uh, we're going to have to use some of those same tools in this period, and it could be quite a long period, while we can hope that we can reach an agreement, for example, for North Korea to not test anymore, to not uh, grow or improve its program, mm -hmm. and eventually to get to a point where it starts to reduce. Now, does that happen absent regi regime change? We don't know that, but I think that's the path we have to try to get on mm -hmm. if we can. So you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, Professor, that that there was an armistice in, in the, at the end of the of the Korean War, but of course there was no peace treaty. Right. And what we understand, I don't know if this is so, but what we read is that that's a big concern of the North's, and mm -hmm. it's part of what plays into this notion that we might be about regime change, because in theory, the North and South are still at war. Right. Um, is that something you imagine are moving toward? Is, is a peace treaty that ends the Korean War? Well, actually, about 10 years ago, uh, we were quite close to discussing uh, that issue. Mm -hmm. So it's not like uh, we never talked about this issue in the past. We actually talked about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, going back to uh, you know, you know, possible negotiation, and it, it's a very difficult to imagine that uh, North Korea will give up. Uh, nuclear weapon. So if we just insist that uh, unless you give up, we're not going to talk to you, I don't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's not only for their own security, but as I mentioned earlier, their goal is to develop their economy after securing, uh, you know, with a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, sure, uh, you know, eventually our goal is to get rid of uh, nuclear weapon from North Korea. But if you insist that that's the only precondition, you know, only when you give up or willing to give up, then we'll talk to you. I don't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. So we should, I think we should talk first. So, so th in the past, in the recent past, the context for these kinds of negotiations have been six-party talks. Yeah. So the Chinese, the Russians, the Japanese, South Korea, uh, the U.S. And, and, and the North. What is the continuing role for the other parties? now that President Trump has said he'd be willing to, to have open bilateral conversations? So I've been saying that maybe you know, four-party talk might be more useful <laughs> to Korea and China and the United States. Because uh, like with Japan, for example, mm -hmm. they've been you know, always talk about adopting issues, for example, and then okay, no other parties are really interested in that. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, having maybe less party might be more, you know, I guess, uh, and you'd keep effective. What, what's the argument for the Russians being out of the conversation? Uh, I'm not sure how much they, are <laughs> they can help. Mm -hmm. 
you just feel like a tighter negotiation. Yeah, so right now, you know, you know, it's reality that now China and U.S. are most important yeah. on this uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, and they've got two Koreas. What do you suppose the reaction is to the fact that the Chinese did vote with us on the sanctions? I mean, I think, I think they went farther than a lot of folks expected, mm. and, and probably that the North expected. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so do you think that that's turned up the heat at all on the North Koreans? I think so. I uh, think it has. Yeah, it uh, has some impact. I, mean, I, I looked at that vote and thought, the sanctions are important, but the fact that the Chinese voted for them is, is more important. The Chinese, yeah. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right. The Chinese have gone farther, I think, than, well, than they have before and that anyone thought that they would. Now, yeah. there's always the question of implementation and enforcement, and you will see you know, uh, differing opinions, and I think still we need to wait and see. But yes, I think it definitely has turned up the heat on, on, on the North Koreans. And you know, we can't, I, I certainly can't read what's in the mind of Kim Jong-un and the, you know, the decision makers in Pyongyang, but I, I think they probably are feeling under some, some heat from the sanctions, which may be one of the reasons that they, they you know, have made this opening uh, uh, to the South. They right. want to take some of the pressure off. Mm. Um, it is, you know, chilled relations between uh, uh, Pyongyang and, and Beijing, right, which are really at an all-time low, I would say, mm -hmm. and are probably going to stay there. Now, that does mean that, you know, China doesn't have a lot of immediate sort of leverage and influence to, to mm -hmm. make North Korea do what it wants. It does have, again, some blunt instruments, uh, which is it's the, the sort of lifeline that, that is offered from Northeast China to some of the trade that does go on, and the pipeline uh, that does provide oil and fossil fuel to North Korea. They're not going to shut that off entirely, I don't think, but they can, they can calibrate it, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and they seem to be a little more ready to do that. Now, you know, should, again, North Korea, North Korea seems to think it needs to, t we, we, I understand from experts that North Korea probably needs to test some more missiles, right, to, to get mm -hmm. where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even another nuclear test. So, mm -hmm. you know, what reaction that brings will be a big question that I'm afraid we may be talking about, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the spring or a little bit later, unless somehow out of this Olympics comes a lot more than I think we can, we can expect, we can hope for, mm -hmm. but. Am I right to imagine that there's a, a, a jittery public in both Japan and in South Korea? Or is this, a is this a level of anxiety that one is adapted to? That's a long pause. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll, take us, I'll take us to another question, and that is, uh, Ambassador, you, you did a memo to, to President-elect Trump in oh. May. <laughs> And had, he read it. <laughs> and had and had recommendations for him. Uh, what were they? Oh, <laughs> I'm so so <laughs> pleased that you read it. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I think there was something along the line of what I've tried to emphasize uh, uh, tonight, and and I at the at, at the center of it, I, I think is to is to recognize that well, China certainly plays an important role. I mean, whether it's six-party talks or whatever kind of diplomacy, that you know, we need to be active on this. Clearly, the U.S. for reasons of our, you know, our history and our stance, we we need to play an important role. But that the you know any progress on this difficult issue of addressing the Korean Peninsula and the challenge of North Korea is only possible if Seoul and Washington are working closely right. together. Right. And maybe he took that advice. I think he's. <laughs> You also advised him to, to name an ambassador quickly to South Korea. Yeah, that he hasn't worked out. Yeah. <laughs> he did in December, I think. Victor Cha, hasn't he well, identified Victor Cha? Well, my understanding is it's not yet announced. Uh. Yeah. Uh, so I don't understand how Washington works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a known quantity. He is. Sure. Um, he's, he was on the NSC staff with right. George W. Bush. I know him very Sweet well. We right. worked together on the six-party talks, yeah. and uh, yes, and and uh, but again, he has not been announced, uh, but widely rumored. Uh, and in any event, it is now more than a year since yeah. there has been a sitting ambassador in Seoul, mm -hmm. and uh, that is certainly noted. Maybe right. to get back to it, you know, how do how do South Koreans feel? Are they nervous? They don't like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and maybe back on the other. I think, you know, they recognize there's a nervousness, but it's kind of held within, I think, because there is a sense of almost what can you do about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So one of the question cards is, how dangerous it, is it to have a vacant ambassadorship? It's pretty hard <laughs> to have those conversations without that. Well, I, I mean, if, yeah. if I could say, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say this is dangerous. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> we have, and I want to say as a, as a former career foreign service officer, we have an excellent uh, uh, chargé d'affaires who's uh, deep, 
uh, uh, Asia specialists with excellent Korean language skills. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are represented on the ground in, in South Korea. But it is important. It's a signal to have an ambassador there, obviously, and there's a question of access when you're an ambassador in terms of the kinds of high-level conversations mm -hmm. you can have both in the capital, in, in Seoul, and going back to Washington. We also have, um, I think, a big problem at the State Department, to be blunt. Uh, uh, you know, Secretary Tillerson, I think, has been active on, on, on South Korea, on the North Korea issue, but he's been undercut by his boss uh, in really quite astonishing ways. Um, it's hard to be astonished these days, but <laughs> it is kind of. And, uh, and, and there are very few Asia experts in the administration. Right. Uh, we do not have a, an assistant secretary of state for East Asia, but even going, if you like, up and down the chain, uh, while I have great respect for uh, some, some of the appointees, Secretary Mattis has been, I think, a very yeah. sound voice, both publicly and I believe privately, on the, on the Korea issue. Uh, those who are in the very senior security uh, uh, and, 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 and foreign policy positions, m many or most of whom have military backgrounds, uh, have most of their experience in the Middle East, uh, and I think we were just lacking that those senior Asia experts. Mm -hmm. Part of that is because most of the sort of Republican uh, foreign policy stable of uh, you know waiting uh, for the Republican victory signed never Trump letters uh, when people thought it was never going to be Trump, mm -hmm. and so they don't have jobs. And I think that's a loss, frankly, for you know yeah, for the for American people, yeah. for all of us. Yeah. Cybersecurity. It turns out that um, that North Korea is pretty good at yeah. <laughs> cyber. Understand cyberspace. Uh, been guilty of a variety of of, of attacks. Some ransomware. Some, mm -hmm. you know, some some an effort to to make money. Some an effort to make, you know bring about havoc or retaliate against Sony Pictures. In in, in one case. Have we thought through, I mean, we're, there's certainly been reported that we've used um, cyber tools to, you know, ensure that a missile or two blows up on launch pad, you know, to, to, to hold back that missile program. Would cybersecurity be part of any conversations as you go beyond nuclear? Is that something else that we need to be talking to them and, in fact, to the rest of the world about? I think I, I, well, I, I think that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I, I worry in a way if I'm uh, more about, about some of these cyber threats than I do about nuclear war. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I, I just, I, I, as you say, the North Korean capability and the Chinese right. as well is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. And they've done some things. I mean, they, they, they obtained uh, the, the military planning of the South Korean military mm -hmm. forces, which mm -hmm. of course includes our joint planning. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have the ability to reach into certainly the United States, but also South Korea, and really disrupt mm. things. So mm. I'm very worried about well. that. I don't know how you have a conversation yeah. about that. Yeah. I think it's a great question, and I hope somebody in Washington is thinking mm. about it. Um, yeah, what's interesting, if, if you remember the beginning of the nuclear age, because we had the advantage at first we weren't very enthusiastic about arms control until we realized, wait, we're not going to have that advantage forever. I think that was some of the thinking with cyber. Uh, cyber capabilities, we did have the advantage, but that that goes quickly, because uh, that's all in you know in the ca capability that's in civilian hands. Mm -hmm. um, as you think about the the kinds of pressures that that one brings about in in the process of talks, I mean, you offer inducements as well as clubs. Um, are inducements like, or if, as you recall, we used food aid as an inducement for the framework agreement. What kinds of inducements would matter uh, in conversations with the North at this stage? Uh, you mean kind of like carrots? Yes, so carrots. Uh, for North. I mean, certainly uh, you know, economic aid. I mean, that's uh, huge yeah. because uh, uh, for the last uh, you know, 10 years, uh, you know, as uh, you know, North and South Korean relations uh, have become cheered. Uh, you know, North Korea has turned into turned to China mo for more and more. Mm -hmm. So now, if you look at uh, North Korean trade, they are predominantly dependent on China, and North Koreans know that uh, they are very concerned. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to reduce their dependence on China, right? And I mean, that's why the, the logical alternative is South Korea. 
And I'm sure they will be looking for uh, economic aid mm -hmm. you know, from countries other than China. Mm -hmm. So certainly you know, South Korea can be one uh, place, or Japan, or United States. Mm -hmm. So certainly uh, economic package uh, is a good incentive. At the same time, would it be enough to uh, make them get rid of nuclear weapon? I doubt. Yeah, yeah. But even if your goal at first were to freeze the programs right, and then right, start talking right, about right. unraveling them, we've also we've deployed THAAD, um, yeah. so anti ballistic missile uh, technology in in South Korea. The notion being that it would blunt uh, an attack um, on South Korea. An attack on uh, South Korea, right? right. Um, how, how uh, you know, that's a bullet hitting a bullet, but at least it's short range. How effective do we, we consider that to be? <laughs> I mean, we don't consider it a total guarantee, right? There's right. You can't be. I, I think it's a more symbolic and political, I think, gesture mm -hmm. than really preventing a uh, North Korea attack, right? I mean, so, I mean, there may be some ways of, uh, you know, defending, but it might be has more symbolic and political value than so actual military uh, in a value. So going back to the notion, though, that, that if we are the threat, um, we obviously are not going to be providing security guarantees. Who will? <coughs> were they to denuclearize, if they were not responsible for their own defense against us, if they really believe right. we're going to attack? Is there another party that can provide them any kind of security guarantee that would induce them to come to the table or to even deal? Well, I mean, to some extent, China has kind of tried that, mm -hmm. right? And it, it probably would be China. And, and, and the United States has, again, in, in the past, including in the recent past, <coughs> uh, tried to I extended security you know, reassurances to North Korea. Uh, I mean, this came in you know, the, the Clinton and, and, and George W. Bush administrations in the form of letters from signed by the president yeah. saying, uh, you know, secretaries of state saying we have no hostile intent towards North Korea, we have no intention to attack North Korea. Uh, there is, to put it mildly, an absence of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so that turned out not to be sufficient, mm -hmm. although I think it was sincere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Tillerson, uh, a few months ago, I, uh, rather uh, uh, dramatically, I thought, uh, but, uh, uh, announced something, uh, it was kind of the four no's, so it sounded very Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I think no, no uh, accelerated reunification, uh, no uh, U.S. troops on any sort of major basis uh, north of the uh, 38th parallel, no regime collapse. There were a number of things, which again were clearly things that the Chinese wanted the North Koreans to hear, and also to reassure the Chinese. Again, I think the problem is nobody really believed him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a readiness on the part of the United States to say that and and to mean it. If you would just sort of give up your nuclear weapons, we wouldn't attack you. We um, and w we have said and we tried both in the uh, in the agreed framework and also during the six party talks to move towards uh, diplomatic relations and a peace treaty, uh, but there was, and again, you will get different versions of the history, uh, uh, reluctance on the side of the North Koreans yeah. as well as on parts of the U.S. and other side because of an absence of trust. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it is also about building confidence and trust, mm -hmm. and I agree with Professor Shin. Right now, unfortunately, it's very, very difficult, mm -hmm. but that's where, you know, maybe the, the, the Olympics is kind of an obvious and a low place to start, but maybe that's where we are. So let's just talk about domestic politics for a moment, politics within in Washington. It's not unheard of for an administration to find a, a, an agreement, an opportunity for agreement, and have Congress pull the rug out from under the president, that it's, you know, it's got its own nationalist fervor ripped up. What are the, what are the politics of, of uh, the Korean crisis on the Hill, on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill? you have a mm -hmm. feel for that, Ambassador? Yeah, that's interesting. We well, you know in a case like Iran that there's enormous, mm. you know, I don't know whether in the case of North Korea there's that same right. political Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, honestly, th I mean, the Trump administration has been, I mean, so uh, <laughs> kind of forceful, and, and, and especially the president himself, that I, I, I haven't really seen the Congress uh, so active. Yeah. Uh, except yeah. to express some concerns, mm -hmm. right, about the the cognitive dissonance 
mm -hmm. of of Tillerson and 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 the president, and that's that's a kind of a bipartisan thing. I think there have been a lot of Republican uh, uh, congressmen, including the chairman of the Senate for or the, the Foreign Relations Committee, who who've been. Um, quite quite concerned about that but i think you do touch on an important point on the iran agreement because i think this gets i think north korea watches that yeah. and they see the same thing they see well if there's an agreement uh and uh and it's happened in our north korea u.s past too and and suddenly either the new president or the congress don't like it and they walk away from it what's yeah. the point of the negotiation so it's not even a matter of building trust in terms of we're not going to attack you it's terms of can we negotiate an agreement that's going to last beyond one administration or uh, a midterm election in Congress. Well, are we going to be in the position of having agreed to something and stuck by it, and then you don't stick by your side of the bargain? My last question then is going to mm. be about the politics within South Korea. Um, President Moon is, uh, has, you know, his party is, it wants to be a conciliatory party. It is the minority in the parliament. What are the pressures on him? Uh, okay, so. I think he's facing a certain dilemma too, because on the one hand, there's strong pressure to correct the okay, wrongdoings of the past, mm -hmm. especially of the two previous governments. So now they're investigating okay, a lot of things, and as you know, you know, former President Park Geun-hye is in jail. Now they're going after former President Lee Myung-bak as well. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand you really have to correct okay, wrongdoings of the past. But at the same time, you have to, you know, you know reconcile, you know, among, you know, people divided uh, in society. So how to put, you know, people together, uh, that's also not an easy issue, right? So uh, there's a certain dilemma, right? You know, correcting wrongdoing, but at the same time, uh, promoting more social harmony and, and integration. Uh, it's, it's a very tough uh, thing to do. Yeah, yeah, they're all in a tough position. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Professor okay. Shin and, for, and Ambassador Stevens, thank you. Uh, for shedding so much light on these issues. And thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you.